Online advertising has become hyper-specific and kind of invasive, but how did we get here? Don't skip. I promise it'll be funny. Here's my cut out and keep guide to the history of online advertising on this week's Simon Cain's Terms of Service. Part one, the first banner ads appear. On the 27th of October, 1994, the first banner ads appeared online and it was this monstrosity. I'd click it just to make it go away. The ad was for AT&T and was designed, if you can call it that, by Joe McCabley in a campaign that focused on futuristic technological wonders. If you clicked it, you were taken to a tour of museums from around the world. Although judging by the banner, it's gonna be more pixelated than a Lego man's junk. 44% of people who saw it clicked it, making it one of the best performing ads on the internet ever. To put that in perspective, today, the benchmark for a banner ad is 0.06%. This is partly because it was the first ad, and if we know one thing about the internet, everybody loves to say they came first. I've just realized why that Pornhub comment is creepier than I thought. It was also a very well thought out ad campaign, but that's a lot less funny. It appeared on the now defunct hotwire.com, which we all remember fondly, and it cost $30,000. And you thought JPEG NFTs were overpriced. Given how well this ad did, marketeers decided it would be worth putting more of them online, and so began the age of display ads. Part two, in 1995, display ads become increasingly targeted. Advertisers quickly realized that much like buying a house or where you rub during foreplay, it's all about location. Of course, this was nothing new. Legendary advertiser from the 1920s, John Wanamaker, said, Half my advertising spend is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. The reason it's wasted is because it's not targeted or tracked. These are two issues that advertisers have been trying to solve ever since. We'll start with targeting, because that's what comes next in this story. So instead of just buying any old digital pixels, ad men started contacting niche interest sites, although at this point in the internet's history, that's all there was. This was so they knew the demographic of the person who would be viewing their adverts. It was a win-win situation on paper. People were getting adverts more relevant to them, websites and chat rooms were finally getting paid, and brands were selling more of their stuff. It was a very exciting time to be living in your mum's basement. But naturally, problems started to occur. The main one being that people stopped noticing banner ads after they'd seen it a few times. So ad agencies limited the number of times you'd see the same advert. This was known as frequency capping in order to prevent banner fatigue. Part three, in 1996, return on investment tracking tools begin to improve. So now they knew where to put it, but had no interest in measuring how well it was performing. Much like every man in the film American Pie. Enter DoubleClick, an online ad agency which was purchased by Google in 2008. DoubleClick invented DART, or Dynamic Advertising Reporting and Targeting. This system told advertisers how well their ads were performing in real time and allowed them to make changes to live campaigns. It sounds pretty pedestrian by today's standards, but before this, advertisers had to wait until the end of the campaign to get feedback on how well it performed. And by that point, it was too late. This also led to a new pricing model for online adverts, cost per impression. Until now, websites were paid a flat fee to host a banner ad for a predetermined amount of time. Now, they're getting paid every time the page loaded. Part four, in 1997, pop-up ads quickly rise and fall. Banner ads could be easily ignored as they were just placed on the website and the content lives around it. So, advertisers needed to find a better way to get your attention. Enter pop-up ads. It's safe to say that pop-up ads were not exactly popular. You see, according to marketing guru, Seth Godin, there are two types of advertising, interrupt and permission. As always, advertisers decided to ask for forgiveness later rather than asking for permission before it went live. Pop-up ads are an extreme form of interrupt marketing because they literally get in the way of the content you're trying to enjoy. Permission marketing wouldn't really become popular or a thing for at least another decade, so look forward to that. Fuck's sake! They've been called Internet's original sin and the most hated advertising technique, and one of the original developers has publicly apologized for helping develop them. Now we live. This is not the time. Nobody is going to join a Patreon from a pop up ad. No, they won't. Oh, no, they won't. This isn't a panto. Okay, they might like and subscribe. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the video. Okay. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the video. And if you have a pound, please 
do think about joining the subreddit or Patreon. Both of those are linked below. You'll actually be the first person ever to join a Patreon thanks to a pop-up ad. Ethan Zuckerman created the first pop-up ad, described it as a way to associate an advert with a web page without directly putting it on the page, as advertisers were worried that it would imply an association between their brand and the page's content. He began to develop it when one of the brands he was working for complained because their advert appeared next to a page that seemed to endorse anal sex. Until that complaint, adverts might have appeared next to anal content, and marketeers thought, but fuck it. I am not apologizing for that joke. In the late 90s, banner ad click-through rates were falling faster than Hollywood's interest in any woman over the age of 30, so pop-up ads were seen as a way to save the industry. And while pop-up ads did force people to pay attention, they didn't actually result in any clicks or sales. And anyway, by the early 2000s, every web browser came with a pop-up blocker pre-installed. But thankfully, newspapers still use this technology to get your email address when you're halfway through reading an article. So it was no waste of time after all. Part five, 1999 to 2002, advertisers turned to paid search and pay per click. It's 1999. And while we're all looking forward to a new Willellium, the online advertising industry is worth $1 billion. But advertisers were getting fed up of paying per view because a view doesn't equal a sale. So they started to want the traffic from the website and not just a second of our attention. At this point in the history of the internet, the number of websites exploded, which led to the launch of several search engines, including AltaVista, Lycos, and InfoSeek. Could you imagine saying, sure, let's InfoSeek that. Anyway, in 1999, GoTo.com, a search engine that Yahoo would go on to purchase, became the first to offer pay-for-placement search engine services. Essentially, advertisers were bidding to become the top search result for a keyword. Some people claimed this would cause the results to become corrupted, but we all know that was and never will be an issue. Paper placement became pay-per-click, where brands asked to be the top result, but only paid when you click their link. This had the obvious downside that the people with the biggest budget appeared above much more relevant results. And in the early days, it was quite hard to tell which were organic results and which were paid for. Something had to change. Part six. 21st century Google AdWords. Google wanted to create a sponsored search experience that generated revenue without compromising the quality or relevancy of the search results. They also had the slogan, don't be evil back then, and we all know how that panned out. GoTo.com then rebranded itself Overture. I'm guessing because they thought people were more likely to say, let's Overture that. Overture allowed advertisers to buy their way to the top of a search result. The higher you bid, the higher your listing but Google understood the importance of relevancy and better user experience. With Overture, an advert might get seen more, but because nobody was clicking it because it wasn't relevant to their search, brands made no money, so advertisers stopped using it. Google noticed this and added a click-through rate feature, which did exactly what it said on the tin. If an ad with a lower bid got more clicks, it would climb the ranking ladder, and Google would start to charge more money for it. Google didn't invent the pay-per-click model, but they did stand on the shoulders of giants and perfected it. Today, almost 90% of Google's revenue comes from online advertising. Once more for the people at the back. Today, Google makes 150 billion a year from online ads. Part seven. In 2006, digital ads start to become hyper-targeted. Advertising is all about attention because we all only have 24 hours in a day. It's the one thing me and my girl Beyonce have in common. Well, that and our big booties. So advertisers will always go where everyone's attention is. At last count, 30% of the world's population was on Facebook. So if you look to your left and you look to your right, statistically, you're all on Facebook because the only people who don't have it don't have an internet connection. This is why they're the leader in what is known as social media marketing and surveillance capitalism. Oh, come on. At least Google named their tools cute things like cookies. In 2018, this form of advertising earned Facebook $11 billion. Even with all of these controversies around their ad platform. In 2006, Facebook ran their first adverts, and it was all going well, until Vodafone got upset that their ads were appearing next to English far-right extremist group, the BMP. Now, I did do a lot of weird keyword searches to check, and this time, none of their content was promoting anal sex. However, the community did contain a lot of arseholes. After that, in 2007, Facebook gave advertisers tools to decide where their ads were seen. 
and they've continued to give them more and more flexibility every single day. Now advertisers can target you based on your location, your interests, your marital status, basically anything you're willing or unwilling to give them as a user of their platform. Twitter saw how well this was doing and decided to copy some of Facebook's tactics. In 2009, the first paid for tweet went live by Kim Kardashian. In 2010, Twitter launched promoted trends and promoted tweets, which Disney were quick to hop onto. And as of 2012, Twitter's mobile advertising revenue exceeded Facebook's. Rewind to around the same time in 2006, and YouTube wanted a slice of this advertising pie, so they launched video ads and brand channels. This did so well that Google purchased them later that year for $1.65 billion. Then in 2008, YouTube launched promoted videos and pre-roll ads. Where the money went, creators followed. And now YouTube is the biggest video hosting search engine on the internet. But I didn't really need to tell you that, unless this is your first video. In which case, welcome to YouTube. My only advice is stay away from the drama channels and try not to fall down a climate denial rabbit hole. Now social networks have enough data on us, their users, they can predict what we'll need, want, love or hate in the future. This would be John Wanamaker's wet dream. Now it's more like only 20% of your advertising budget would be wasted and social media sites have been able to eliminate more and more uncertainty. And it's all thanks to a startling lack of regulation. Yay! Part 8. In around 2015, permission marketing became fashionable. Permission marketing is where someone has given you permission to send them a message. It's actually the earliest form of advertising and communication, and predates everything in this video, in the form of email newsletters. Around the 2010s, brands who wanted to be seen as people, and people who wanted to be seen as brands, worked out that advertising is fickle as fuck. And although it can work in the short term, Usually, a better strategy is to build a relationship with your fans so you never have to compete on price. So they started to build their own online communities to speak to them directly. This could be as simple as following them on Twitter or joining their subreddit, linked below. By offering interesting, exciting, or even controversial content, brands and people, which are basically one and the same at this point, connected with their audience on a deeper level for less money while building trust and not having to play the algorithmic games to appease social networks. Today, most brands and advertisers use a combination of both permission and interrupt marketing to get their message to the right people. Part 9. The future of online advertising. Who knows? Facebook is betting on VR ads and its metaverse. TikTok is hoping short-form videos will trick us into watching super quick adverts. And Google, well, Google is just buying anything that is currently sucking up all of our attention. Personally, I think the future of advertising is in the hands of creators. I think creators and influencers will have much more authority and attention in the next decade. Audience numbers on TV have been in decline for the last couple of years, and radio stations are putting their shows out as podcasts to try and keep up. Really, it comes down to good storytelling, trust, and putting the audience first. Three things that advertisers are not necessarily known for doing. But if you think differently, please write it below. I'd love to know your opinion on the future of online advertising. If you want to support me and help grow my little community on here, you can like and subscribe for more quality content. Also, you can become an internet explorer via my subreddit or Patreon. These allow me to tell you directly when a new video comes out, so I don't have to rely on YouTube's algorithm. Both of those are linked below. If you did enjoy this video, you're going to love this video about why Facebook wants to own the world of VR. And it's not just for advertising spaces. Godspeed, and I'll see you all next week.